stories told of a pastor's gathering in the 1780s in England where a young pastor by the name of William Carey stood up and made an appeal to his fellow pastors that they would collaborate, unite forces, in order to try to get the gospel to people who have not heard of Jesus. And as he was making his appeal, trying to rally support for this mission of world evangelization, one of the elder statesmen of that gathering stood up and reportedly said, Young man, sit down. When God is pleased to convert the heathen, he will do it without your help or mine. Well, fortunately, William Carey didn't sit down. Within a few years, he was commissioned by his own church and in collaboration with other particular Baptist churches, he then set sail for India, where he spent the rest of his life never returning to England for the purpose of taking the good news of God's grace in Jesus Christ to those who had never heard of him. So over those more than 40 years, Carey, in preaching the gospel, saw wonderful things accomplished. He established a college for the first time there. He established many businesses there as well. He translated the Bible or parts of the Bible into 44 different languages. And he preached Christ faithfully such that finally after seven years there was one convert. And then in the years following there were many more converts, churches planted. And through his labors and those who labored with him and those who came after him, the continent of India saw many generations of Indians coming to call Jesus Christ Lord. In this way, William Carey is a wonderful illustration for us of what the Apostle Paul writes about in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. And we want to return to this passage today for our ongoing study of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. Today we're going to pick up in the middle of verse 15 and look through verses 16 to verse 17 to complete what we began last Sunday. If you use one of the Bibles provided for us, you'll find this passage on page 946. And I want to encourage you to get the Scripture in front of you because we're just going to look at the words that the Spirit of God inspired the Apostle Paul to write so that we might be edified today as we study it. So look at Romans chapter 10. I'll begin reading in verse 14. We'll read down through verse 17, but you'll note in verse 15, there's a new sentence in the middle of it, and that's going to begin the focal point for us this morning. So hear the word of the Lord from Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. In order to call upon the Lord for salvation, people must hear of Jesus Christ, and they must hear from Jesus Christ. These verses are Paul's further explanation of what he's just written in verse 13, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if that's necessary for you to be saved, you must call upon the Lord. Then the question naturally arises, how can this happen? How does this work? How does anybody call upon the Lord. Last week, we started looking at that question, beginning in verse 14 in this passage, to see what these verses teach us about the process of calling on the Lord for salvation. I mentioned last week that we can look at these verses and divide them into four different sections. And we looked at the first of those sections last week in verses 14 in the first part of verse 15, where Paul elaborates the nature of the process of calling on the Lord. There are four rhetorical questions in those verses. Verse 14, the first part of verse 15. And those rhetorical questions are used by Paul to underscore our responsibility to make the gospel known. And we see in those four rhetorical questions five steps 
in the process. If you just look at the verbs of those four questions, you will get this process clearly in mind. So let me just point them out to you again. In order to call upon the Lord, that's one, that's really the final step because this is given to us in reverse order. You must believe in Him, that's the second. And in order to believe in the Lord, you must hear Him, that's the third. In order to hear Him, someone must preach, that's the fourth. And in order for someone to preach, they must be sent, and that's the fifth. Well, Today, we want to continue our study of this passage by looking beginning at the middle of verse 15. Specifically, I want us to see from verse 15 into verse 16 and 17 the nature of the preachers who go to preach the Word, then the nature of the responses to that preaching, and then finally the nature of the relationship between faith and the Word. So look at the latter part of verse 15. What is the nature of the preachers? Those who proclaim the good news of salvation are beautiful in God's sight. That's the language that is used here. The last two rhetorical questions that Paul asks us in verses 14 and 15 bring up the question of preaching and preachers. Look at them. How are they to hear without someone preaching? Then verse 15, how are they to preach unless they are sent? And immediately after this, Paul then cites an Old Testament passage in order to be something of a commentary upon those people who actually do the work of preaching. We see this in the middle of verse 15, where he says, as it is written, and he's quoting Isaiah 52, 7 here, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, when we go back to Isaiah 52, 7, we can see that Paul here is summarizing what that verse says. Let me read it to you. It says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. Now, in Isaiah's day, it was common for news to be sent and spread abroad by runners. And oftentimes this would happen from battle scenes to take news back to headquarters, news back to the capital city about how the battle was going. And the character of the news that the runner would report would be reflected in the manner in which the runner actually ran. Good news would be joyfully, excitedly carried by the runner. And bad news would also be carried by runners but in a more kind of plodding, reluctant way. And city watchmen, those who sat upon the walls, to look out over the horizon for any threats that might come or for news that might come, they got to the point where they could tell whether it was good news or bad news coming from the runners by the way that the runners were running. A swift-footed runner was a beautiful sight. Because the fact that he was running with some pep in his step meant that he had good news that he was anxious to convey. Well, Paul here is saying that those who proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ are like Isaiah's runners who come with good news of happiness. That's what he means by this when he says, how beautiful are their feet. They are a welcome sight. Well, to whom are those who proclaim the gospel a welcome sight? Well, not to everybody. They're not a welcome sight to people who just tolerate the message or who dismiss the message. In Acts chapter 14, we read of Paul and Barnabas going to a town called Lystra. They healed a man there in Lystra who had been crippled in his feet and When the citizens of that town saw it, they said, oh, the gods have come among us. These are Greek gods. This is Zeus and Hermes who have come down among us. And when Paul and Barnabas heard how they were misinterpreting what had happened there, they went among them and said, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news. We're preaching the gospel that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So Paul and Barnabas preached the gospel to them. 
And was it received as beautiful, wonderful, good news? No. What did the citizens of Lystra do? Well, you just keep reading Acts 14. You know what they did? They stoned Paul. And then when they thought he was dead, they dragged him out of the city and left him to die. You see, the gospel wasn't received as welcome news, and the people who preached the gospel weren't regarded as beautiful by everyone. That's always been the case. The messengers who bring good news are seen as beautiful in the sight of God and to those who not only hear the good news, but who receive the good news. To those who are blessed by the good news. Who take it to heart. In the sense in which Paul is using it here, those who are saved by the message of the gospel. Thank God for the people who brought it to them. Brothers and sisters, we should highly esteem those who carry the gospel of salvation throughout our world. Whether that means that they go to South Asia to preach among Muslims who do not know Jesus Christ, or whether they go to Fort Myers Beach and preach to people who perhaps have heard of Jesus but don't know savingly who He is. Christians who intentionally tell others the gospel have beautiful feet in God's sight, and we also should esteem them highly as messengers of Him. Well, after identifying the nature of the preachers, those who bring good news to others, Paul continues in verse 16 to describe the nature of the responses to such preaching. Not all who hear the gospel believe the gospel savingly. Look again at verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? To believe the gospel savingly is to obey it. That's what Paul is saying. Do you see the parallelism between these two words, obeyed and believed, in verse 16? Paul quotes Isaiah's words to support his own statement. He says that they've not all obeyed the gospel for, Isaiah says. So Paul's making a statement. Not everybody's believed, obeyed the gospel. And I'm going to prove it to you by citing an Old Testament passage in other words they've not obeyed just like isaiah said when he prophesied lord who has believed our message you see obeyed in the way paul is using it is equivalent to believed now what's going on here is paul after having written so strongly against salvation by any works any effort that we could ever offer up to God, is he now beginning to mix faith and works? Is he beginning to say, yes, you must believe, but you must also do things? No, he's not mixing faith and works. What he is doing, rather, is acknowledging that saving faith is a faith that obeys. Saving faith works saving faith results in a way of living that is different from those who have no saving faith i like the way that new testament scholar tom schreiner has put this he writes true faith always involves commitment and submission to the lordship of jesus for paul faith is not merely verbal assent but it entails a wholehearted commitment to God. The kind of faith that unites a person to Jesus Christ is the faith that, as Paul puts it in verse 9 of this chapter, acknowledges the lordship of Christ. It calls Christ Lord. Now, this is vitally important for us to understand. Saving faith is not mere intellectual assent. Saving faith trusts it submits to Christ as Lord. It depends upon Him and offers up one's life to Him in obedience. This is the same point that is made in John chapter 3, verse 36, which says, Whoever believes the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Though the word obey there in John 3 is different from the word that Paul uses in our text, 
it carries the same idea of being compliant. To believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, so as to have eternal life in Him, is to be compliant to Him. It is to be submissive to Him. Not all who hear the gospel, who have ready access to the gospel, embrace it savingly. That's Paul's point. When he puts it this way, not all, it's just a kind of a polite way, an understated way of saying, most who hear do not believe. And Paul, remember, is referring primarily to his fellow Jews. This has been his main point since verse 6 of chapter 9 when he asked the question, is it the word of God failed? Of course not. The word of God has not failed. He's trying to, to set before his Jewish readers especially, but all of us, why so few Jews have come to embrace Jesus Christ as Messiah when the promises of the Old Covenant under the Old Testament era were given to the nation of Israel. The Word of God hasn't failed simply because the Jewish people have refused to believe that Word. The fault is all their own. And by invoking Isaiah, Paul is saying, this is not something that is unique to my day. This was true in Isaiah's day. In the last part of verse 16, Paul cites Isaiah 53, verse 1, which says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The promise of the Messiah. The Messiah who is going to be described so eloquently as we heard read in the rest of Isaiah 53. This promise was for everyone who would believe. It was for the Jews if they would have believed it. And yet, not many in Isaiah's day believed in this Messiah to come. And Paul is saying, it's that way in his day as well. Not many believed in Paul's day. They missed their Messiah. They missed Jesus. They missed the fulfillment of the promises that had been made to them and to their forefathers throughout Old Testament history. And the same thing is true today. True not just of Jews, though it certainly is true of Jews today that, that most or not all have obeyed the Word. But also of Gentiles. Not many are being saved today. Why? Because the Gospel is not powerful? Because God's promises have failed? No, no. It's because they have refused to believe what God has said. They refuse to take Jesus Christ for who He is and to receive Him as Lord. When Paul makes this point, he's actually making a play on words that's not so evident to us in English. But if you look at verse 14, I want to point out to you how he's doing it. In verse 14 it says, And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And then, how are they to hear without someone preaching? The, the words there, heard and hear, have the same root word as our word in verse 16, obey. And yet there's a difference. The word obey has a prefix added to it. And it comes across in English, it's not exactly the same, exact, but anyway, it comes across in English like the difference between listen and listen up. Listen up. You know, you can say, yeah, we, we listened to all kinds of stuff, and you can do that almost inadvertently, nonchalantly, without really engaging. But when you listen up, you, you pay attention. You give yourself to notice what's being, say, what's being said. You don't want to miss it. You don't want to just hear it. You want to heed it. Do you remember or have you ever heard about the miracle on the Hudson? It took place 2009, January 15th, when Captain Chelsea Sullenberger, better known as Sully, made an emergency landing on the Hudson River of U.S. Air Flight 1549. And he did it minutes after having taken off from LaGuardia Airport. Before takeoff, the flight crew had gone over the pre-flight instructions for all of the passengers. And if you've ever flown on a commercial jet, 
you've heard these little routine statements that are made by the flight attendant. After the plane is fully loaded with the passengers and the doors shut, one of the flight attendants will get on a PA system and say, now we request your full attention as flight attendants demonstrate the safety features of this aircraft. Now, what do most of the passengers do? You know, do they, they sit up and they say, where's my notepad? I've got to take notes here, you know. Or do they just kind of keep playing dots on their phone, you know, or maybe getting a last-minute text off before they have to turn their phones completely off? And the flight attendant usually continues with something like this. When the seatbelt sign illuminates, you must fasten your seatbelt. Insert the metal fittings one into the other and tighten by pulling on the loose end of the strap. I mean, who doesn't know how to do this, you know, but they have to say it. To release your seatbelt, lift the upper portion of the buckle. We suggest you keep your seatbelt fastened throughout the flight as we may experience turbulence. There are several emergency exits on this aircraft. Please take a few moments now to locate your nearest exit. Now, do most passengers listen to that? I mean, they hear it, right? They hear it, but they're not paying attention to what's being said in those pre-flight announcements. But on January 15, 2009, when Captain Sully announced that he was about to make an emergency landing in the Hudson River and they needed to listen up, do you think anybody continued to play dots? No, they paid attention. And when they were told to get their life jackets from underneath their seats, they got their life jackets out. And when they were told to find the nearest exit, you better bet their heads were on a swivel. They wanted to know where the exit was and how to get to it. They were determined to heed the instructions. Why? What's the difference? Their lives were in danger. They recognized the seriousness of what they were being told. They knew that their lives might well depend on believing to do, believing in doing what they were told. And if they didn't listen, it could result in complete disaster. So they listened up. They listened submissively. They listened compliantly to the instructions. Well, that's precisely the point Paul is making in verse 16 of Romans 10. They have not all obeyed the gospel. It's not for lack of opportunity. They'd heard the gospel. Preachers were sent to them by God, but they didn't heed the message. They didn't comply with the call of God to turn from sin and trust the crucified, risen Savior that He had sent into the world for sinners like you and me. Now that's true for many of you here today. There are many of you here today, you have heard the gospel message. Some of you have heard this message all your life. And you know the truth, the elements of this message. You might even believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. And you know that He became a real man and that He walked on this earth 2,000 years ago. And you may believe that He actually died on the cross. You may even believe that after three days God raised Him from the dead and even that He ascended into heaven where He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty right now. And you may have some sense of belief that he's going to return one day. You don't doubt what you've heard. You just haven't submitted yourself to the truth of what you've heard. You've not come to believe it. You've not come to obey the gospel the way Paul speaks of here. You haven't bowed to Jesus Christ as Lord. You haven't confessed your sin against God and looked to Christ as the only way for your sin to be forgiven by His life and death and resurrection. You haven't asked God to save you. And friend, I just want to ask you the question, why not? Why not? You would never stand before God and say, you know what, I don't believe all this stuff. You know what? I don't believe in an afterlife. I don't believe in heaven or hell. You wouldn't have the audacity to say that in the immediate presence of God. So why would you sit here today 
other days. And hear this message of salvation designed for people like you and me, the only way that you can have your sins forgiven and just hear it, but not heed it. What is it that keeps you from right this moment taking God at His Word and trusting this Word and submitting yourself to Christ so that you say, Lord Jesus, save me. Don't pillow your head tonight without bowing to Jesus Christ as Lord. Don't leave today without hearing this call of the Gospel that God's designed for you to hear and submitting yourself to Christ. If you will trust Christ, He will accept you. He will, trust, he will save you and reconcile you to God. Well, not only does Paul identify the nature of the preachers and the nature of the responses, he goes on in verse 17 to describe the nature of the relationship between faith and the Word. The relationship between the Word of Christ that is preached and the responses to that Word. The nature of that relationship is this. Saving faith comes from hearing the Word of Christ. Look at verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. That little word so keys us in here to a, a succinct summary that Paul is about to make for what he's been writing in the previous verses. He's going to give us a summary of his explanation about how anyone comes to call upon the Lord for salvation. The means by which faith is created is hearing. Hearing. Faith comes from hearing. Saving faith is created when the message of Jesus Christ is heard, when it is received, there's a mystery to this that we don't fully understand. But it is through the message proclaimed that faith is created to receive the message. It, it, it sometimes, I, I sometimes think of it like this. When Jesus was standing before the tomb of his friend Lazarus, who'd been dead for four days, and he had the stone rolled away. Get this picture in your mind. And he looks at that tomb and he says, Lazarus, come forth. Now, did Lazarus have the ability to come forth? He was dead. I mean, if Lazarus had had the ability to come forth, he wouldn't have needed Jesus to tell him to come out. But it was in the word, it was in the message, in the proclamation that faith was created, that life was given so that Lazarus could respond. Brothers and sisters, that's exactly the way it works in our evangelism. We set forth Christ before people who are outside of Christ, who need Christ, and we do so knowing that only as the Spirit owns that message will faith be created. But Paul tells us right here that faith comes from hearing. Without such proclamation of the gospel, there will be no saving faith. Do you want your faith strengthened? Do you want to grow in faith? You know how that happens? It's through the word of Christ. It is through proclamation of the word. When we gather like this, this is a faith building exercise for the people of God. When you read the Bible and you meditate on it and you try to memorize it and get it into your heart and mind, that is the way the Spirit not only creates faith, but builds faith. Now, obviously, Paul does not mean here that everyone who hears the gospel will trust Jesus. He's just made that abundantly clear in verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. His point is that the only way that saving faith can come to anyone is through the proclamation of the gospel. And we see this illustrated throughout Scripture, especially in the book of Acts. And sometimes just go back and read Acts chapter 16. When Paul shows up in Philippi and there's a group of ladies there that are involved in a, a time of prayer, a, a time of gathering, seeking the Lord. And Paul begins to teach them. He preaches the gospel to them. And Luke, who was with him, 
records the scene in verse 14 of Luke of Acts 16. He says, One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. And listen to Luke's description of what happened to Lydia. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. You keep reading, you see that having believed the gospel, she was baptized. What's going on there? Faith comes from the preaching of the gospel, from the proclamation of the word. It comes by hearing. Brothers and sisters, do you have someone in your life that you want desperately to become a Christian? Somebody you're praying for? Maybe somebody you've talked to before and your words just seem to kind of fall off their back like water off of a duck. And you're tempted just to kind of quit and think, well, they'll probably never be saved. And so you don't talk to them. You don't speak the gospel to them. You don't try to help them to come to see the message. The only way they're ever going to come to saving faith is by hearing the gospel by this message being set in front of them. And God's given you the gospel. You have it. They need it. The only way that they're ever going to come to saving faith is if that message is set in front of them and the Spirit owns it. And you can't control the Spirit, but you are responsible with this message to make it known. We should do what we can to explain the truth of Jesus to our friends, our loved ones, to strangers. Tell them who He is. Tell them what He's done. Help them come to see why that matters to their lives. Encourage them to trust Him. Faith comes by hearing. That is the means by which faith is created. And then at the end of verse 17, Paul quickly adds, the source from which faith is created is the Word of Christ. The Word of Christ. Now that phrase, the Word of Christ, It can mean the word about Christ or the word from Christ. And the the reality is both of those are true. The point is that Christ is the source of the message of what is to be proclaimed and what must be believed. You see, believing human opinion, no matter how clever it might be, has never saved anyone. And human opinion is not what you and I are called to proclaim. That's why it would be a travesty to stand in front of a congregation like this and say, open your Bibles and read a few words and then close it and give you a lot of stories and opinions. That's why it would be completely without warrant in any use for you to just tell people your stories about things that you believe and you think without setting before them the truth of Christ, the Word of Christ. The source of saving faith is Jesus Christ. We must set Christ before those whom we desire to be saved. And if you want to be right with God, you must trust Christ. You must hear Christ in His Word. You you must heed the Word of Christ, the message of salvation. You'll never be right with God any other way. You'll never be good enough for God by doing religious things. Your only hope is Jesus Christ. And God has sent Christ into the world to do everything necessary for your salvation. And if you refuse to heed the word of Christ, if you refuse to trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you will not be able to say on the day of judgment, nobody ever told me. I never knew. Because it's not true. The Word of God is being set before you right now. Young people, children, hear this. Hear this. You need Jesus Christ. You must have Christ in order for God to accept you. And Christ has been sent into the world to save people like you. So trust Christ. Take God at His Word. Believe what the Scripture tells us about this one way of salvation. This is the only way anyone will ever call on the Lord. So brothers and sisters, we must see ourselves as stewards of this 
one way, this gospel. The Lord has given us this message, this word of Christ. And if we don't spread it, who will? If we don't carry the message with us, then we shouldn't be surprised that no one cares about our Christ. We're responsible before God for this. And we should go about proclaiming Christ, recognizing, sadly, sorrowfully, that some will not heed this message, but also with hope and joy and assurance that some will. There will be people who turn from sin and trust the Lord Jesus. So let's be faithful. Let's resolve to proclaim Jesus Christ, Christ both formally and informally, where we have opportunity to do so, and pray that He will use our proclamation to cause many people to call upon the Lord and be saved. Because this is the only way anyone will ever come to do so. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for this glorious Gospel, this wonderful message of salvation, the only way that Poor lost sinners can be made right with you. We thank you that you didn't require us to climb a mountain or to perform a certain number of works, but you have set before us the accomplishment of salvation for everyone who will believe and obey this gospel. You said that faith comes by hearing, hearing from the word of Christ. Spirit, would you not now take this word of Christ? And create faith in those who walked through the doors today unbelieving. To the glory and praise of the Lord Jesus. We ask in his name. Amen.